further ado, I would like to welcome um, um, Mayor Bose uh, to the Political Economic Circle lecture this evening. And uh, after his contribution, I'll, I'll open it up to colleagues to ask any questions or clarify uh, any issues that have been raised and have a, a healthy debate. Over to you, Mahe. Well, thank you, Indrajit. Um, I must hire you as my PR man, though I'm married to a PR lady, but I think you do, you do a great, wonderful job. Actually, I've written more than 27 books, but who's quibbling about a few books? Um, it's wonderful to speak to the National Liberal Club, and you're speaking from the Nairobi room, which for me is very historical, because I, when I was growing up in Mumbai in the years soon after India got independence, the main road on, on which our flat in Mumbai was, uh, was situated was called the Dada by Nairobi Road. So, you know, to, to actually um, uh, address you while you're sitting in that room is, is, um, is wonderful. We, we used to call it the DN Road, you know. And of course, it's very interesting about uh, Nairobi. He was the first Indian to become uh, an MP in the House of Commons. And when he stood, the markets of Salisbury said, uh, um, the British will not vote for a black man. Uh, but they did. He got elected by three votes. So there you are. I mean, you know, um, it shows history has come a long way. We have come a long way. Um, of course, uh, my starting point is we talk about a post-racial world, which was talked about a lot after Barack Obama got elected. I think a post-racial world is a myth. We'll always live in a racial world, but what we can live in is a non-racial world where race does not determine what you do, um, what opportunities you're given, um, what chances you have in life and how you progress. I mean, that, that is worth, um, worth striving for. And in order to do that, we have to look at our past. I disagree with L.P. Hartley here, who said the past is a foreign country. No, as far as we are concerned, the past is very much the present. And, and I agree with the American philosopher, George Santana, that if you uh, forget the past, you are condemned uh, to repeat it. Now, nations struggle, let's face it, to come to terms with their past. The only country, I think, in the post-war world, which has come to terms with this past, has been the Germans with regard to its Nazi past. Maybe because it was so awful, the Germans had to look at it, but they have done it very well. The land of my birth, India, has struggled to come to terms with its past. As I speak, um, the Indian Prime Minister, who should be more concerned with the coronavirus, is, is laying the foundation stone for a temple to be built um, where a mosque was torn down, which is, uh, in my opinion, one of the worst things that has happened in independent India. And, you know, that, that past, reconciling India's very many conflicting strands is, is very difficult. And this country has an enormous problem with this past because, really, um, the way the country projects itself is, this is the tight little, right little island. Britain never, never shall be slaves. This is the island that stood against the Nazis when the whole world was against it. And yet, this is the island that went and ruled other countries, conquered them, enslaved them. In India, British rule is called Angrezo ki gulami, it's a Urdu term which I'll translate, which means the slavery of the British. I know some of you listening to this will immediately say, oh, no, no, it wasn't slavery. Yes, okay. Technically, it wasn't slavery, but loss of freedom. Is, 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 and Churchill called this in the Second World War, loss of freedom is slavery. And in that sense, that's how the Indians see it, slavery. But, and it's very interesting about the empire. I came to this country in, in January 1969, seven months after Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech. And everybody, when I raised the question of the empire, this was, of course, uh, 22 years after India had got independence, which started the, the dissolution of the, of the British Empire. Uh, by the way, a, a little word about the British Empire. Um, there was a saying, there used to be a saying about the British Empire that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And Krishna Menon, the Indian freedom fighter, who was a very prominent Labour Party member here uh, during the war and before the war and later on became Defence Minister. His retort to that was, that is because God doesn't trust the British in the dark. But leaving that aside for the moment, um, what I was surprised that people said uh, they'd forgotten the empire. And my, my um, feeling has been in the last nearly 50 years that I've lived here, that the empire hasn't been forgotten. But the empire, the story of the empire is not understood. And this has created two problems, what I call the problems of the two G's. What are these two G's? One is guilt and the other is gratitude. Now, I do not want and I do not expect and I don't think it's a good thing for and it, it can't be expected that 
people who are descendants of the conquerors or slave owners for that matter should feel any guilt for what their ancestors did you can't do that you should know what your ancestors did you should acknowledge what your ancestors did but not feel shame about it but at the same time the people who were enslaved the people who were conquered their descendants should not feel should not be made to feel gratitude and this is i am a descendant of the conquered because my ancestral land were conquered by the british and am i supposed to feel gratitude that the british came and civilized my ancestors and 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 uh, and you say oh well you know uh, nobody talks about civilizing well actually and i shall quote this a bit later on um winston churchill often talked about civilizing the primitive Indians. And this was in public speeches. There's no secrecy about it. Those speeches were published and so on. And they're, they're very well known. Now, if therefore you are saying that the empire was a force for good, then you're really asking me to say, admit that my ancestors needed to be civilized. Now, my ancestors were not wonderful people. No, they did all sorts of things. I am from one of the uh, Hindu upper castes and our treatment of the so-called untouchables or the, the least of their left called was absolutely dreadful. I also come from a, the uh, landed Jamindari system, landlord system, which the British created. Before that, there was no la uh, land, la uh, landed estate system in India. The, the king um, owned all the land and we um, treated the Muslims who were the majority in the part of India that we came from very badly. There's no question about that. Yet, I do not admit, or I, 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 will, I will absolutely refuse to accept that my ancestors needed to be civilized, however bad they were. They had their qualities as well, some of which I admire. Now, yet we do have, and this is, this is a huge problem. We have Western historians who have emerged in the last few years, very, some of them very prominent, who do want me to feel gratitude. One, one uh, example, a clear example, is Niall Ferguson, a very distinguished historian. In his book, he says the British Empire was a force for good. And one of the examples he gives is, interestingly, the creation of the city of New Delhi, which was, of course, a British creation when the British moved their capital from Kolkata uh, to, to Delhi. And he says, look at New Delhi. It's so much better than the old Mughal Delhi. And therefore, the Indian should be grateful the British came and built New Delhi. Uh, yes, the Indian should be grateful the British came and built the railways, but they didn't come there to build the railways. They built the railways with Indian money. The Indians constructed the railways, many died, and and it was, if you like, a collateral benefit, not intentional. And incidentally, it's very interesting, the Japanese, who had a dreadful regime in Korea, the Koreans will never forget the, uh, forgive the Japanese, will forget what they did, and when the Koreans and the Japanese uh, staged their um, joint um, uh, World Cup, uh, the Koreans made it very clear they hated the Japanese. In fact, the opening ceremony reference was made to this. And whenever I was then writing at the Telegraph, whenever I would say um, uh, Japan, Korea, um, World Cup, I would get a letter from the, the Korean am ambassador in this country saying, no, no, Korea, Japan. And yet the, the railways that the, uh, the Koreans, the Japanese built in Korea, what was interesting was that they also built, um, they also um, uh, started factories building engines in, in railway engines in Korea, whereas the British never had any engines built in India. The first engines of railways that were built were built after the British left. I point this out just to, just to point out that the empire and who's colonized who and how they ran the empire is a very complex subject, which is full of nuances. Not that I'm comparing the Japanese empire with the British empire. The British empire was nowhere near um, as, as, as ruthless and rapacious and cruel as the Japanese were. And, and the Indians don't have the feeling towards the British that the Koreans have um, towards the, ja uh, the uh, Japanese. But the question is, of course, the British went there not to run a Victorian NGO, uh, but they went there to conquer, to plunder. The word loot, for instance, comes from India. Um, and it came about because of the way Robert Clive um, um, started the empire and, of course, the amount of money he plundered from it. And what is different about the British Empire? And this is where European, not just the British, but the European empires that have changed the world from about the 16th century, starting with the Spanish and the Portuguese and carrying on with the British, the French, the Belgians and the Dutch, is that the empires of the Europeans, and the British said this very, very clearly, they said to the conquered people, we are here for your good. We are not here for our good. We are, we are bearing a lot of burden to be here. And, and that was a novelty. 
you know, Cengiz Khan, when he conquered and plundered, he didn't tell the people, I'm here for your good. No, no, he said, I'm here for my good. That was the difference. And, and, and you know, it's very interesting. I spoke about Winston Churchill. Let me quote one of his speeches. This was given in the Trade Hall of Manchester on January 30th, uh, 1931. Churchill, this is Churchill speaking. Out of 350 millions of Indians, only a very few can read or write. And of these, only a fraction are interested in politics and Western ideas. The rest are primitive people, absorbed in the hard struggle for life. They are dependent on their livelihood and for the happiness and peace of their humble homes upon the rule of a very small number of white officials who have no personal interest of their own to serve, who are quite impartial between race and race, and who have built in 150 years an organization which has given these enormous ma masses peace, justice, and a substantial increase in material well-being. We have a supreme moral duty to discharge to the Indian people. The British were very good at spinning the empire and Churchill was the master in it. Now, I won't go into the details of the empire because that is not really. The, the point is that um, we, we need to understand, you know, this, this almost makes it suggest that the Indians in the, in the 17th century wrote to the British monarch saying, please, we can't, uh, we can't rule our countries. Do come over and rule us. In fact, it's the other way around. If you read the letter of Elizabeth I, written to the Emperor Agba, she actually misspelled his name. He, she called him invincible emperor, a man of great humanity, wonderful prince. And she pleaded with him to allow her subjects to trade. India then was the second most economic power in the world, uh, second most important economic power in the world. Um, China was the first and Britain was almost bottom of the table. So, you know, the British were wanting to trade and of course that trade led to, led to the empire and all that sort of thing. And then the British managed their empire very skillfully, no question about it. Um, the British couldn't have lasted a single day in their empire um, unless millions of Indians had collaborated with the British. And I, I am a descendant of, of, of people who collaborated with the British and benefited from, from British rule. And here again, another world about how words are used. The British don't like the word collaborators. They call them loyalists. Now, when I mention the word collaborators, immediately I'm told, oh, no, no, they assisted. Whereas, whereas it's all right to say uh, that the French collaborated with the Germans. It's not right to say that um, Indians collaborated with the British. And the Indians themselves, of course, have great trouble coming to terms with, with their own past, as I've said. Now, um, it's very interesting here to mention that um, uh, some years ago, I mentioned to a colleague of mine, the Sunday Times, Stephen Fay, a wonderful writer, uh, sadly died a, a few months ago, uh, that India was a very great economic power uh, in the pre-British days. And he just mocked me and said, oh, you got it all wrong. And a few months ago, just I met him just before he died. And he said, oh, I've got it all wrong. My, my reading of history was wrong. Um, now, uh, this brings me to reading of histories and statues. Um, I personally don't think statues should come down. If a statue is built, it should stay there. The taking, the taking down of statues is not a good thing. I personally also think the statues should not be in public squares and so on. They should be in museums where the history of the person whose statue is being put up, um, he or she, is, is, is explained, the historical context, which could be a very complex thing. But let me take two statues which illustrate again how, how, the, how, the, how the complexity and the contradictions here that we have in Britain. The statue of Robert Clive and not very far away, the statue of Boadicea. Now, what's interesting about Robert Clive's statue is Robert Clive's statue was, put, was, was erected almost 150 years after Clive had won the Battle of Plassey to start the British Empire. It was, it was actually erected at a time when the empire was waning. It was meant to proclaim that the empire was important. It was meant to proclaim that Robert Clive, in winning the Battle of Plassey, had started an empire that was such a force for moral good. Clive actually was a forger and, 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 and a quite a dreadful man. But nevertheless, he started the empire. And that was the reason it, it was done, right? This is, this is the symbol of, of power. This is the symbol of the civilizing mission that the British said they had in their colonies and particularly in India and, of course, other places. Right, let's go to Boadicea. Who is Boadicea? She's a savage queen. Why isn't there a statue of the Roman general? who defeated and killed Boadicea. He was a civilized man. There's no question about it. Roman civilization was far superior to anything that existed in this country when Boadicea was here. But why are we honoring Boadicea? We are honoring Boadicea because she fought for the freedom of her people. She may have been a savage queen and nobody, no historical figure as far as I know doubts that, but she had the right to fight for her 
people to remain free. So see the contradiction. On the one hand, Clive is being honored because he started a process that enslaved Indians, where well, Berdicea is being honored because she, though she failed, tried to stop being enslaved by a higher civilizing power. And of course, you may well say this is, this, the, both these statues speak only to the, the, to the descendants of the British who were conquered. Well, if that is the case, then I like living here. I'm very glad to be here. I've had lots of opportunities in this country. This country has been good to me. Then what do these statues tell me? How do we reconcile history when people come from very different backgrounds? That, that really is, 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 is a very good question. And of course, I, I, um, I mentioned Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill is, is a great figure. There's no question. Winston Churchill's, um, I mean, it's very interesting. I've just been reading. I had I'd, um, I'd, um, known of the book, but I hadn't read it before. Robert Rhodes James's book, um, uh, Churchill, A Study in Failure. If, if, you, if you stop Churchill's life in 1939, um, it is a failure. Um, uh, and, and Robert Rhodes James uh, proves that. But after that, there is no question Churchill's role in the Second World War cannot be doubted. Yet, Churchill himself, and he didn't, he didn't deny this, was a racist. He, he spoke openly about it. And what is more, and this is very interesting, um, given what is happening now, the second most important person in this country is a Hindu. Churchill actually hated the Hindus. Let me, let me um, uh, uh, read this out to you uh, about, um, uh, uh, about uh, Churchill. Um, uh, this is Churchill coming back from Yalta. 1945, he's uh, the great conference between Churchill, um, uh, Stalin and Roosevelt, which decided the post-war world and all that. He's come back. He's having dinner at Chequers with his uh, Downing Street secretary, James Colville and um, Bomber Harris. And Colville records in his diary. And again, these are publicly available. I'm sure you know it. But anyway, I'll remind you. Um, um, uh, 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 Colville had given Churchill a book on India where the author had denounced the Hindus particularly, but India in general and said why uh, Britain needs to rule India because the Indians won't be able to manage it. So Churchill, um, Colville asked Churchill what he thought of the book and, and this is what he records. The PM said the Hindus were a foul race protected by their pullulation from the doom that is their due and he wished Bert Harris could send some of his surplus bombers to destroy them. Now, I mentioned the story because some time ago, about two or three years ago, I um, wrote an article for History Today in which I said that contrary to popular view, the British were not actually anti-Muslim. They were actually anti-Hindu. For about 200 years of their rule in India and before, they were anti-Hindu. They didn't understand the Hindu religion, and it is, I must say, a complex religion. Uh, I'm a Hindu, though I'm not religious. I don't believe uh, there is a, a heaven up there which will have a perfect batting wicket where I'll finally score 100, um, you know. Um, but, um, and of course, actually, Hindu religion is not a religion. It's a cuisine. It provides the best food after prayers. But, but leave that aside for the moment. The fact is that, the, that the, the complexity of the religion, the number of gods and so on and so forth, and, and they, they considered they actually liked the Muslims. And though Churchill didn't think the Muslims were civilized in that sense, he valued the Muslims as soldiers. He thought they were brave, courageous men, whereas the Hindus were full of deceit and, and things like that. He talks in his speeches in the 30s, he talks about Hindu despotism and so on. And it's very interesting to also point out that during the war, the the mosque we have here, perhaps the greatest mosque in this country, the Regent's Park Mosque, was land given by Churchill to, 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 the, to the Muslims who wanted a, a church, and a, 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 a mosque rather, and it was opened by George VI. Imagine, it's hard to imagine um, uh, the monarch today opening a, a mosque, but you know, um, times change. The, you know, it's, that's another story, but the, the Conservative Party, despite its um, um, uh, uh, anti-Hindu history, and it also had an anti-Jewish history that was cured by Mrs. Thatcher, and the anti-Hindu history was cured by David Cameron, and we can see the result of that. We have three prominent Hindus in the cabinet, and, and the Hindu vote in the last election, from what I can get, other, um, voted in large, large measure uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to the Conservative Party, not the Labour Party. I think what, what we are struggling with is we are trying, we're struggling with getting a unit. Now, but by the way, 
just finish on Churchill, um, while of course I was brought up on the idea that Gandhi was a great man, I think Gandhi was a great man. If I had a choice of dinner between Churchill and Gandhi, I'd always choose Churchill. I mean, the idea of eating food with Gandhi would be terrible because he he's, he ate sort of dreadful food, in my opinion. With Churchill, you know, you'd have champagne, wine, you know, all sorts of wonderful food, and 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 it would be a very entertaining evening, I'm sure. Um, I think the problem we are facing, and this is the problem that that is very difficult to solve, that the the, the history we talk about, we you know there's a lot of talk about whitewashing history, and you know, the right history is not not written. No, what has happened is that the history we are taught is the is the is, is the history created as a result of the European conquest of the world. Such a conquest had never taken place before. Alexander the Great may have thought he ruled the world, but you know, um, Alexander the Great had no impact on India beyond, beyond Northern India, had no impact on China or things like that. He didn't, he didn't get anywhere like that. The Europeans were different. They took over the world and the history we have is the universal history. And to give you an example of that, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example, two, two figures from history. The first is Machiavelli. Now, we all know who Machiavelli was. We may not have read The Prince, but we know Prince is a book on statecraft and so on. But how many of you in the Jeet might know, but how many of you know who Chanakya was and what his book Arthashastra was about? Chanakya lived in India 1700 years, 1700 years before Machiavelli. He wrote a book on statecraft, which was uh, the bedrock of the Mauryan Empire of India, which was the, which was the um, one of the biggest and the most powerful empires India has ever had. Uh, um, the grandson of the founder was Ashoka, one of the great Indian um, emperors who later on became Buddhist and so on, made India Buddhist for a brief brief period of time. Now, if you compare Chanakya's Arthashastra with Machiavelli's Prince, which came 1700 years later, you might get the impression that actually Machiavelli plagiarized Chanakya. But nobody outside India knows um, Arthashastra or Chanakya. And what did the Indians do when they got independence? The Indians uh, renamed the area of the diplomatic enclave in New Delhi, for which, as Ferguson said, Indians should be grateful the British built it. They called it Chanakya Puri, which means the land of Chanakya. So at least the, the, the foreign diplomats who are in, in Delhi know who Chanakya was. But world history, the people of the world, apart from the Indians, don't know. So for me, an Indian, I have to, I have to cope with May, two... can you just hold uh, for a second, because we yeah. lost your uh, uh, audio. Oh, when did you lose? Interrupt you. In when did you lose it? The yeah. rest of us can hear him. The rest of us can hear me here, I think. Oh, hello, Rupert. How are you? Lovely hello. to see you. Very nice to see you. I'm going to have a word later, but I'm sorry, just... I'm I'm boring you all. <laughs> Certainly not, uh, but I think they're having problems at the club uh, in hearing you, whereas the rest of us who are dialing in from all over are hearing you fine. I so shall I carry on? I think you should carry on. We I mean, I'm 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 coming to the end of it anyway. Your so. HQ, we're loving it. Please fine. carry on. Uh, Mehe, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. We, we lost your... I've, I've, lost, I've lost in the deep now. Sorry, I don't, I don't quite know. I can, I, can, I, I can go on talking. Okay. Mehe? Right. Can you hear me now, Mehe? I can hear you, yes indeed. Fantastic. Um, sorry, we lost the audio at the point when you were just about to talk about New Delhi and the diplomatic quarter. Oh, yes. Um, I've, I've spoken about Machiavelli, right? So, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, what I've said is that after India got independence, the um, New Delhi, of course, had to have a diplomatic quarter. Uh, the city, um, which, as, as Fer Niall Ferguson says, the Indians should be grateful that the British got, went to India to, to, to build this wonderful city. Um, and they decided that the diplomatic quarter would be named after Chanakya. And therefore, it's called Chanakya Puri. So while outside India, people wouldn't know who Chanakya was and his Arthashastra would mean nothing. At least the diplomats in India know this is Chanakya Puri. And what I was saying was that for people like me, with my background, I have two balls of history to balance. One is what may be called universal history, but which is European history. And the other is Indian history, which, which, which is of course influenced by European history. It is not uninfluenced by European history, but which has a certain other perspective. So for me, while I know about the Battle of Trafalgar, 
I also am very aware, and that has had a much greater influence on India's history um, than uh, that is the Battle of Panipat, which um, uh, which is a um, an area near Delhi, which is now famous for its carpets. Actually, it's, it's a pretty um, uh, rundown, uh, decrepit uh, um, um, area. But the three three great battles of India took uh, took place there, and much much more important in the Indian story than the Battle of Hastings, which I think the actual battlefield. I mean, the Indians should, probably should learn from Hastings because I think the actual battlefield there has been made into a supermarket. So probably the Indians should should um, build a, a supermarket in in, in the in the battlefield. Battlefield at Panipat, but they haven't done that. I think um, um, there's a couple of other points I want to make. You see, the Second World War is a very good example of how um, um, the British have a very tabloid version of history. Of course, the British fought against the Germans, no question about it, and we should be eternally grateful that Churchill overrode um, Halifax's attempt to do peace um, with Hitler um, uh, um, uh, after the fall of France. However, it, Britain was not alone. No, even as they were fighting um, uh, uh, Hitler at the time, with um, Hitler had, being in an alliance with the Soviet Union and America not joined the war, there was a whole empire. Two million Indians um, um, fought for the British. There were Indians in Dunkirk, though the film Dunkirk um, uh, doesn't doesn't show that. And there was another factor about the war, which was which is very wonderfully analyzed by the greatest political writer this country has produced, probably the greatest political writer any country has produced, George Orwell. Um, and I'm going to use the, the N-word now, so I hope you don't mind. The reason is that is actually the title of the piece George Orwell wrote a month before the start of the Second World War. The title of the piece, and I, I emphasize again, that is the title of the piece. It was called Not Counting Niggers. And what he said was that the democracies, the so-called democracies of the West, actually all had colonies and they had no desire to give these colonies freedom. In fact, Churchill signed the Atlantic Charter, which was, was proclamation during the war was that it was promised freedom to everybody. And then he came back to the House of Commons and made it clear that that didn't mean freedom for India or any of the colonies because these, these were already part of the empire and didn't need to be free. They were already having the best of times, as it were. So, you know, we need to look at the complexity of that history. We need to look, we need to move away from this tabloid version of history we have. If we don't do that, we are not going to get what, what we would like to see, which is a proper multiracial world. As I said, you can't have a non-racial world. The fact that you have different races and you acknowledge that there are different races, it's not a bad thing. If you tell me that I am of Indian race and uh, my, you know, I have a permanent suntan, which I do, that's a fact of life. That doesn't make you a racist. No. If I tell you you are pink or white, that doesn't make me a racist. No. It is if you use the fact that you are of a particular race, as the Europeans did and other races have done, and use that to get advantage which the other races can't get, which to depress other races, suppress them. That is what, um, that is what the problem is. And that is what um, uh, causes racism and um, the problems of this world. And I think we have gone too far. We have, we've actually um, defined the word racist in such a curious way now. Uh, and I'll end with one example again from sport some years ago. I was at the um, Scottish Cup final between Hibernian and Hearts. Now, they are um, Edinburgh teams, one Protestant, the other Catholic, reflecting the um, Protestant-Catholic fight in, in Glasgow, much more famous teams, uh, Rangers and Celtic. Anyway, um, Hibernians were doing badly. Heart of Midlovians were winning 5-0. Um, my wife, who was with me, noticed that the Heart uh, of Midlovian um, manager um, was wearing a suit and the Hibernian manager was in a track suit and uh, said, why don't you tweet? That just happened. The Hibernian manager was Irish. The heart of Midlovian manager was Eastern European. And I mentioned that, um, is, is it because that the heart of Midlovian manager is in a suit? Uh, he's of Eastern European origin and therefore he's, he's better than, that, that reflects the scoreline and the Hibernian manager is, is um, in a track suit and he's Irish. And I was immediately accused of being racist. Now, I could be accused of being xenophobic. But, you know, there are Irish people who are people of different colors and so on, um, and they're Eastern Europeans. And I think this is where we need to be precise about terms. And we really need to learn history and appreciate that people who come from different cultures, because of the impact that the European cultures had on them, may be juggling not just one ball of history, but more than one ball of history. Thank you very much. Wonderful. 
Wonderful, Mahir. Thank you very much for taking us on the journey around the legacy of empire. Um, there's lots of uh, interesting things that you raised, uh, which are food for thought, um, particularly around uh, the, the, the word uh, collaboration <laughs> and uh, the loyalty aspect of it, which is, uh, I think, a constant theme that runs through, as you said, the popular press. And, and the media here in this country. Um, the statues you've touched on, and uh, I respect your desire to keep them up, uh, but in a museum, in a context that illuminates rather than uh, sort of takes away the history uh, from us. Um, I, I'd like to also just add one other thing. Um, from where I sit, I mean, I, I, I remember the Suffragettes film, you mentioned Dunkirk, and I watched that on uh, in Piccadilly Circus, the largest screen in Europe. Um, and I savored that moment because I just had a, an operation and I come back and I said, oh, oh, th this is an epic film and I must go and watch it. And I want to watch it the biggest screen there is. And I was very sadly um, disappointed that, um, Yet again, the contribution made by the empire um, uh, countries and the Commonwealth had, had been airbrushed out of history yet again. And then that followed the suffragettes, the centenary. Again, another Bolly Hollywood uh, epic, uh, no mention of uh, Sophia Dalip Singh, who was quite an active uh, participant in the suffragette movement in this country. Again, airbrushed out of history. I think Anita Singh, Anita, sorry, Anita Anand uh, has put the record straight. And then, uh, perhaps we can touch on that as to how history is being written from the perspective of the colonized rather than colon <laughs> uh, rather than the the, the 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 hunters, as it were. So at that point, you know, I'm happy for you to come back. Any anything I've said, and I'd like to open it up to some of the colleagues who have some burning questions to ask you. Okay. Uh, fine, I'm. I'm happy to. I, I. I take your point. I think. I think history has been. You know, the conquerors write history. But as I said, the European conquest of the world was different to the conquests of Genghis Khan and Nadir Shah. I mean, Nadir Shah was the greatest plunderer of India. Took took the peacock throne from the Mughals and and took it to to Iran. But they didn't pretend that they were doing it for your benefit. That is the problem, and that is the legacy to a certain extent that has to be addressed. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mahir. Uh, Tim, uh, what, what are the names? Hello, this is Don and Samanti. Hello. Hi, Don. Do you have a question? Yeah, yes, uh, I do. That was very interesting. But um, I was just wondering, you seem to have a problem with the word civilizing mission. Would you, but would you accept that uh, you could see the British era as the start of the modernization of India? Would modernizing be a better word for you, perhaps? And I the don't other thing, sorry, uh, other, other point that I have is about uh, uh, the reference you made to Hindus and Muslims. I agree with you, but uh, in the Northwest frontier in 1897, when Churchill went to cover that, he went as a young reporter to cover that, and he wrote some terrible descriptions of the Muslim tribesmen who were fighting there. And of course, you must know about Rudyard Kipling was also very upset with the Muslim tribal people in the Punjab area. Later they became his friends, but when they were not his friends, his descriptions are quite disturbing. So I just thought I'd just point these two out to you about the British attitude in the attitudes in the subcontinent. Well, first of all, I did mention to you, Churchill didn't think that the Muslims were civilized people, but he admired the Muslims. If you read his Frontiers and War, he, he ends it by talking and, and praising the Muslims, saying these people were barbaric, but how wonderfully they fought. So, so there is a big difference between how he saw the Hindus and how he saw the Muslims. As far as Rudyard Kipling is concerned, Rudyard Kipling said it, no Briton will ever have any problem with an understanding Islam and the Muslim religion. Whereas the British had great problems understanding Hinduism. In fact, Macaulay, 
who, who instituted yes. the legal hmm. legal system, basically said to his wrote to his father. He said, "The moment we we can civilize the the Hindus, they will give up their their wretched uh, religions." And during during British rule in the in in um, um, in the twenties and the and the forties, when of course as a result of um, of Gandhi's movement, the British had to have a, a propaganda offensive. They financed two books. One written by an American and the other written by a, a, a Briton who had actually was actually um, um, a pro-Nazi. That was the book that Churchill had read in, in Yalta. Um, uh, they, and if you read those books, it's very very clear. And these were books financed by the British. They, they were they were they were government propaganda, though they didn't admit it. And, and you read what they wrote about Hinduism. There is no question of the feeling. As far as I don't have a problem with civil civilization. No, I don't have a problem with civilizing people. Brought modern ideas. Okay, well. The the Japanese got modern ideas. Mo what do you mean by modern ideas? You you mean democracy? The British didn't bring the sort of democracy that the Indians have is 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 not what the British br uh, um, brought in. I mean, the, if you if you see the 1936 election, it was based it was based on having a quota system of voting. There were separate electorates for the women. There were separate electorates for um, Hindu women, Muslim women, all sorts of uh, communities and religions. No, it wasn't a one person one vote that was that was then in 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 in, in, um, in, in the British parliamentary system. And the British said, and these are cabinet papers available now in uh -huh. 1917 um, uh, when the cabinet discussed having responsible government in India. Uh, Curzon said he was the former viceroy and of course a minister and um, cabinet presided over by Lloyd George. It will take Indians 500 years to learn to rule themselves. Oh, that, that's there of course and there's Macaulay's education minute too but I think what I'm talking about is say the start of education, the start of the English language, opening this window on the outside world for instance and also Frankly speaking, reforming certain things, the position of women, for instance, had deteriorated terribly under the Mughals and the Muslims. And if it wasn't really for the English, it would have been a, it would have been quite dreadful for women in India, being sort of exploited by the Brahmins on the one hand, and of course there was the Muslim problem on the other. Of course, it was the Muslims that drove the women into that kind of situation. So I think, and then of course there were the other kind of things that were cleared up. So what I think I'm looking at modernization from that angle, of course, no, but you I, mean, don't, but I, I, you, I don't you seem to be suggesting, you seem to be suggesting that you have to be conquered to be modernized. I, I don't I'm accept not... that. I, no, no, hang on. That is what you're suggesting. I don't accept that no, argument. No. You can have modern ideas coming without being conquered. And, and that, that do you have to be conquered in order to accept modern ideas? No, what well, I we, think... are, we, are, we are now getting modern ideas without being conquered. You don't need well, to be, this is you're, a different you're, I mean, you, you, if, you're, if you're saying that, then you have to accept that, that um, the British Empire was such a force for moral good, it was a good thing no, it happened. No, it, it, uh, it, I, I, can't, I can't accept that I, argument. One can't be so black and white. What I'm trying to say is that one can't exactly be so black and white. And therefore one has to look at look at things in a slightly different perspective and therefore not totally negative, uh, have a negative attitude towards what happened. And obviously the inception of modernization has to come from a point. And in India, it happened in that way. I'm not discounting all the things that you're talking about colonialism and what happened to the reforms, etc. the legislatures after that, etc., etc. I'm not disputing all that. I'm just saying the start of modern India. And that's why I'm saying if modernization would be a better word, than say civilization. And I have to say, you see, about this question about the Muslims, I mean, I have done a lot of work on Indian frontier history, and I can see in the minutes, in the books, etc., uh, all the kinds of violence, for instance, that happened over there, the policies that were followed. Uh, it was not a very, I mean, I don't know if you've read the Akbar Ahmed's article, for instance, uh, about, I mean, he talks at length about, you know, the colonial encounter there. It was romantic for the English, but according to him, of course, it was terrible for the, the tribal people over there. And they were Muslims, of course. And there are huge minutes, you know, as to what dangers these tribesmen possess and these Muslim tribesmen pose to the empire. That's where I'm coming from. I'm not disputing what you're saying about the rest well, of Well, may, I, may I suggest, may I suggest you read my book, Silver, which discusses what, what was there in the Northwest frontier. I've discussed all that. I mean, I'm, we, I'm talking of a broad view of, of, the, of, the, of the view that the British took about between the Hindus and the Muslims and how they, they, they favored the, the Muslims. That's the, that's the way I'm talking about. 
Okay, Mahir, thank you for that. Thank you. That's that's a really interesting debate developing. We have uh, a question uh, live from the Naroji room next. Uh, Yisha, uh, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, uh, actually, uh, just a very really quick uh, question. Because last time when I had a meeting, I was in my house and my computer was broken. I couldn't make any questions. I can't hear you very well. So, um, we'll just shift the uh, microphone. Yeah, so, sorry. I said last time I had a problem with my phone and hope today I could, I could, I can make this question. So, yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. It was very, very good. But uh, I'm afraid after listening to you um, and also the, the debate with Mr. Mrs. Data, I think I'm more agree, tend to agree with Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Uh, Data a little bit more because uh, with the British Empire um, happening in Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, all the, what I'm saying is the, the sort of Chinese, uh, the East Asia uh, related to this kind of empire. It seems to us, uh, from people from Chinese po point of view, is a success because uh, now after uh, 1980s, when, when China was opened, when we come out to have a look, uh, it looks like Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, uh, is all much modernized in terms of rule of law and uh, uh, freedom of speech and everything, people, and of course now what happened in Hong Kong now is terrible. We, we, we don't want to go there now. Um, the last question I'm sure, uh, talking is, uh, recently our, uh, on the chairman of uh, Rupert and Tim, we had our, our uh, after the BLM uh, movement, we had in our club, we had a, a, what they call a diversity group and we discussed about the, the pictures and the stuff settings in the in the in the in the club. And um, I'm one of those people I agree to, to say the history, look at the history. You have to respect the history. What, what's what's going on? You know, you can't just like grab everything, uh, destroy everything. So I think uh, what I want to ask you what do you think about the, our um, the, the, the club, our uh, pictures, everything. Just like a very, very simple question. Yeah. Sorry, what do I think about your pictures in the club? I, I really don't know your pictures in the club. I, I think I've only visited it once, so I, 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 I can't comment on the pictures because unless you tell me what the pictures are. I, I, I'm afraid I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to tell. I'll have to walk around the club and, and, and comment on the pictures if that's what Anyone you want me to do. to do something here. Um, perhaps uh, once the lockdown and the, 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 yeah. the pandemic... Uh, the constraints are removed. I mean, you're very welcome to come here uh, and I will organize that for you. But it's a little unfair question to ask you this evening. But I think if, if, if I'm right, uh, the, if you follow the same theme as, you, as your contribution in your speech this evening, uh, the, the issues around the statues and the context where they should be. Well, I didn't make it clear. I, I don't believe in taking down statues. But I think if you've got to have statues, you've got to understand why the statues were put up. And the statues were put up for a political purpose. And therefore, the, the best place for statues are museums, which explains the historical context of the statues, not gives a tabloid version of what, I mean, Edward Colston's statue, um, you can read the, the, the inscription on it and what it said. That didn't give the history of Edward Colston. Not that I, I, I uh, approve of the way it was, it was taken down, but it's the museum is where the statue should be. But otherwise, what, are the sta what is the statue saying? The statue is saying to a person who is a descendant of the slave, look at this man um, uh, who, who um, uh, was an integral part um, um, of, the, of, the, of, of slavery. And you should be, you should be grateful uh, that uh, he was an integral part of slavery. Is that what it's saying? That's very difficult for a descendant of 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 of, uh, of slaves to accept. Hmm. Uh, what do you think? I mean, given the the, the government's um, made it very clear in the last uh, few days that the, the decolonizing the curriculum, the education system in England in particular, is off limits. I mean, it, it, what, what do you feel as a lost opportunity? I think it's a lost opportunity. As I said uh, in my speech, we don't have universal history. We have history uh, written from the European perspective. At some stage, if we are going to have this non-racial world, which is what we're striving for, we'll have to create a universal history. So when you speak of Macaulay, you should speak of Chanakya. You know, there was a very interesting example of what happened, um, and I'll give you a cricketing example, but it had a wider history. Um, um, and on the first day of the first test between England and the West Indies, rain held up play and sky, um, uh, 
prompted, I'm sure, by the Black Lives Movement, which has been an amazing phenomenon to arise so suddenly, um, uh, and asked Michael Holding, the great West Indian fast bowler, one of the great all-time greats of, of cricket, um, to, to, to say something on race. And he, he mentioned, one of the points he mentioned was about history, how Edison created the light bulb, but, the, but, the, but there was a, a, a black person who was responsible for, for creating the filament, and I'd never heard of him. So you know, there you are. So, so if you are a if you are a black West Indian, you would know the two names. But if you're not, you wouldn't know. So how do we how do we create history which 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 takes into account everybody? Good point. On that note, I'm going to put on. Uh, thank you, Isha, for your question, uh, which uh, I'm sure we'll both. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, the lady mentioned Ch uh, Hong Kong. You know, it's yes. very. This is um, and the thing about Hong Kong. Yes, the British ruled Hong Kong better than anybody had probably ruled it. If we're going to have a Premier League of empires, the British would win the Premier League without a without a ball having to be kicked. Okay, let's concede that. But is that, is that what you want, a Premier League of Empire? And the idea that Hong Kong was free under the British is not true. Hong Kong had certain liberties. It had a British justice system, but Hong Kong was still a colony. And a, col a colonial rule was of a certain kind. It wasn't freedom. This is a complete nonsense to argue that. <laughs> Um, Mehe, I'm going to move on to another question. Um, I'm going to take two questions in a row, if I may, because I want to bring in Rupert to do, do his bit in about, about seven o'clock. Um, uh, Digby, then Rory, please. Oh, good. Um, uh, th thank you for taking my question, Mehe. Calling from Florida in the United States. My goodness. Um, well, that is yeah. a very, very free country with a great history. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Uh, but before I jump off this session, which I've thoroughly enjoyed, I'd like to ask you a question, the short, a short answer. If you were, if ask your personal opinion, on, on a scale of one to 10, you yourself, would you feel guilt or gratitude with regards to the empire? Well, I can't feel guilt because <laughs> um, I, I um, you know, um, I was not responsible for the empire. And I don't feel I have to be grateful um, for the British for coming to India. But if, if, if India had to be colonized and if India had to fall to a power, I am, I, I'm happy it was the British and I'm very happy to live in this country. And this country has given me many opportunities and the British Empire, the, the, whole, the whole British um, uh, uh, experience of ruling was a very nuanced thing, very complex thing. It wasn't, it wasn't simple. I mean, racism was central to it, but it, the British racism was, was much more complex and much more nuanced than racism in America or in South Africa and so on. So I, I, I certainly can't feel guilt because, you know, um, I wasn't, my, my, I can't feel, you see, but let me give you an example of guilt and gratitude. As I said, my answer sisters, being rich uh, Hindu landlords in what is now uh, Bangladesh, which was a Muslim, um, uh, the, 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 the part of East Bengal of the old Bengal in India, which was a Muslim majority country. Um, and we um, treated, my ancestors treated the Muslims very badly. And um, in order to um, write my book on India, um, which I've written from midnight to glorious morning, I went back to, to the land. Of course, we lost all that, the time of partition. And the Muslims there, who treated me very, very well, made it very clear they resented how my ancestors treated their ancestors. And I had to accept that, yes, they resented it. But I can't feel personally guilty for that. I'm, I'm aware of how my, the Hindu upper caste uh, behaved towards the, the Dalits and so on. But I don't feel personally guilty, but I must acknowledge it happened and make sure that I do everything possible that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Well, maybe the next time when we get to chat, we'll, we'll reminisce the times in 1966 when you were at my home in Calcutta and we played with Corgi toys. You might even remember <laughs> that instance, okay? That was a long time ago. <laughs> Rory was in Digby. Digby. Digby next. Uh, thank you, uh, Mihir. Very, uh, very interesting um, talk. I hope my initial question isn't disrespectful to the seriousness of the topic, but I couldn't help wondering whether Jock Colville said how much Churchill had had to drink of that evening when he invited Bomber Harris to uh, attack the Hindus. He had a lot to drink, but Churchill's views on the Hindus was not, this was not a, a one-off. 
you read his speeches in the 1930s and 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 uh, he talks about hindu despotism and so on you read the diaries of mayaski um, which was mayaski was the um, russian soviet ambassador here during the war and he makes it very clear what his views on the Hindus are. He said, if, if India is given freedom, the Hindus are, you know, um, just um, lawyers and so on. They can make an argument. They can't fight. The Muslims will take over. It's very, very clear. This was not a one-off thing. And, and I'm sorry, this, by, by, by suggesting that, this is, this is denial. Churchill said that. He meant it. And his views on the Hindus never changed. So, a more serious point, could you... Am I right to think that your thesis, you would like to see the British basically change our educational curriculum so that I, a, a, a lot of the good points that you would like to see in our society would thereby take root? Yeah, I think that what we need to do is educate people more about what exactly was the complexities of history not sort of give a tabloid version of history. That, that is what I think, it, because what, what we're doing now, we are trying to do in this world something that has never been attempted before, which is we are trying to bring very different people from very different backgrounds in one society with very different histories. And, and, and to do that, you need to reconcile. And these people have all had parts to play in, the, in that history. Their ancestors have had. And how do you bring that out? To make that, and that is, this is, as I said, this is not to make the people guilty of, about what, what happened in the past. You can't feel guilty about what happened in the past, but you've got to know what the past was in order to discuss it. And if you don't do that, you can't move on to the present. You can't be comfortable with the present. Good point. Mir, thank you. Thank you for the set of questions. Can I invite um, Rupert uh, to say a few words? Uh, thanks, Indijit, and uh, I want to say thank you, Mihir, on behalf of the club. Uh, we haven't uh, seen each other since I became chairman of the National Liberal Club, and uh, I want to endorse uh, Indijit's invitation. I hope I'll be around. Uh, I'll be back in September. I don't know whether you have a chance to drop in soon after that, but I'm uh, very keen to see you there. Um, we're very proud of the club and its, some of its inclusive traditions. Uh, inclusive history, I mean, really, uh, and uh, Dada by Naroji, of course, being a big part of that. Um, I know because you and I have cricket in common, uh, and I, it's lovely to hear you talk about something else uh, for a change. Because um, you know, we've we've been on. A, I've been. I've had the privilege of being on a Mihir Bose cricket tour <laughs> of uh, the United States of America. In probably oh, really? some of you may think. Uh, but I, I was thinking about that, you, you batting there, trying to win us the match. Well, yes, in vain, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but, um, I, you know, anybody who can organise a cricket tour of the United States is, is a man, uh, a, a very versatile fellow, and so me here <laughs> is. And thank you very much for this evening. Um, I, I mean, I, I, you were bound to pick up on Michael Holding. I watched that interview. It was fascinating. It was fascinating for... Um, him mentioning the West Indian who'd uh, invented the filament that went with the light bulb, a uh, crucial part of it, um, forgotten. And you've, you've done the same with your guy who I'm afraid I won't be able to pronounce. I have to see it written down. But the Chanakya. Indian, what did it say it again? Chanakya. Chandrakya. Chanakya, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, this, is, this is just so fascinating. Um, the different nuances. We're becoming more and more aware at the moment of how differently people from different backgrounds, different e ethnicities, different corners of the world have perceived events. I mean, I'm, you and I are a similar age, and I think back to my childhood and when I thought that, you know, it was great that the time when the world was mostly pink, you know, <laughs> the British Empire was just wonderful. And now I think not, and I'm glad you say that, you know, just as we shouldn't feel, you know, certain Indian people shouldn't feel grateful for the British, uh, we, perhaps the British shouldn't feel guilt, because if you said, you said some of your ancestors uh, did things you weren't particularly proud of, mine, uh, my ancestors were big in the East India Company. And I've just been 
reading, I've just finished not long ago, William Dalrymple's mm -hmm. fantastic book, The Anarchy, okay. all about the East India Company. Yeah. And I realised what a terrible bunch of bandits they were. Terrible people. As you say, Clive was a dreadful, dreadful man. Uh, he may have a statue in London, but he, he's, he's a shocker of a man. And um, uh, we're learning new things about history all the time. And I think bringing these different perspectives together is, is so healthy, so helpful. Um, and so I just want to say, um, uh, my wife uh, Kitty sends her love. And oh, well, send her my love, please. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you very soon at the Liberal Club, Mihir. And, and on behalf of everybody here, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. And wonderful to see you again, Rupert. And I think the last time I saw you was actually on a cricket field. So, uh, so I think I haven't seen you since then. Possibly. I, I must go. Thank you so much, Mihir. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Rupert. Uh, enjoy your rest of your evening. Um, we'll carry on for a few more minutes, Mihir, if you still yeah, have time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the other things I was going to pick up on was um, we're looking at the sort of Hollywood theme uh, and your connection with the BBC. Um, not so long ago, uh, George Mendes uh, uh, produced another epic, 1917, yeah. which looked at the uh, well, the historic well, uh, as, uh, Hollywood as much as uh, they, they don't portray history in accuracy, etc. But Sam Mendes, yes. Um, and essentially, uh, there was a debate uh, during question time where Lawrence Fox was yeah. one of the participants that particular evening. And he had basically made comments around, there were no Sikhs. Uh, yeah. Why would they be in Europe fighting mm. for the British? And this was politi politi political correctness gone mad. I'm just paraphrasing as to what he said at, during question time that evening. Yeah. And the, the whole kerfuffle just became a, a massive issue in the, in the popular media yeah. uh, thereafter. And Lawrence Fox basically stuck to his guns and until some historian from the Sikh community uh, pulled up and basically provided the facts for him, yeah. Yeah. Uh, including his grandfather who had served and uh, but was actually uh, 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 decorated soldier. Mm -hmm. I just wonder your thoughts on this. I mean, is this uh, the, the level at which the debate needs to ensue, you know, in, in public nowadays to, for this to, I mean, the chair of the, I mean, my point is the question time chair did not have enough knowledge that there were different communities serving under the British in Europe fighting um, the war in 1917. Yeah, but this is because of the way the British Empire has been looked at, you see. The idea that Indians served with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the British, the idea that the that the uh, the British Empire army was mainly made up of Indians, the idea uh, the and this is a historical fact that apart from the apart from the South African war which was a war the Boer war which was a war between two white tribes and no Indian forces were involved, there was no war from the middle of the of the from the from the uh, from the middle of the 18th century where indian troops were not involved if the british were either conquering some some part of the world putting down a rebellion or as 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 in the first world war um trying to stop the germans and the the point is that history does not properly record this. I, ha I have, I've not, not got it here right in front of me, it's on another floor. I've got a um, 800 or 900 page book, which I'm sure is there in your in the wonderful library of, of the Second World War, um, written by um, a, a professor, an American professor of history of, of German origin, and he doesn't mention any any Indian contribution. And so, you know, the point is, and I think Lawrence Fox went to say, oh, I don't know my history, but he knows enough about his history to, to, to question the, the presence of the Sikh soldiers. The point is, what it has become is the story of the, of the, of the Indians, and if you like, the, 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 the non-whites who fought with their, uh, their white lords during the First World War has become the story of the others. I mean, for instance, uh, um, the, in, in Gallipoli, the, 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 the best fighting, the, the bravest fighting was done by the Indian soldiers, not the Australians. This is, this is, this is a fact hardly ever mentioned. And the Australians um, um, were very surprised and um, 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 they, they killed a couple of Indians because they, did, they, they couldn't distinguish between the Indians and the Turks.
So, you know, the, the point is, and, and what, what essentially what we're dealing with is, if you like, that the empire was um, Downton Abbey or Upstairs, Downstairs, which used to be the, the, um, the, the very popular sitcom many years ago when I first came to this country. The, the, the upstairs were the, were the white races. The downstairs were the non-white races. Now what has happened, Downton Abbey has moved on and we now have everybody in the sitting room. But of course, the people who were downstairs, their previous existence as servants have, has, has, has not been explored. And this, of course, is, is generally a story of true of any society where you have a master-servant relationship. The empire was a master-servant relationship. And at the end of the day, it was a master-servant relationship based on race. Hmm. I want to touch on something else that you mentioned, um, which is um, the, the Queen... The British Queen writing to um, was it Akbar? Um, a couple yeah, of which yeah. basically uh, saying let East India Company trade, uh, you know, with, with India at the time. Um, and I mean, has the pendulum swung again towards the East? I mean, the BRICS, uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China uh, is mentioned by Goldman Sachs in the last fifteen odd years, where. You know the, the the economies of those eastern countries are in a far better shape than perhaps some of the western countries now where we're seeing large number of countries imploding as a result of covid 19 now and the economies are not as resilient as once we thought they were so i'm just wanting to get your take on the gdp where where india was or China was um, before East India Company arrived and where it ended up? Well, in 1750, it's very interesting that seven years before um, Robert Clive won the Battle of Plassey, um, uh, China had 32.4%, if I've got the right figure, uh, of world trade. India had 29.8%. Britain had 1.7%. And by the beginning of the 20th century, India had 1.9% and Britain was top of the league. Now, that position is changing. The Chinese, of course, have been very successful. The Indians have been less successful. And I'm afraid I'm not a fan of the Modi government and what it is doing now, and particularly what's happening in there today. And, and I'm not sure that India's economic drive hasn't hit a, a buffer, hasn't hit a barrier, and we'll have to see how it goes. But certainly, um, the, the world economic order is changing. How far it will change, how far it will go, remains to be seen. And, and you know, um, but China certainly has, has, has emerged as, as, if not the most powerful economic power, certainly second to, to America. And, and it, unlike Japan, which at one stage threatened um, uh, American economic power in the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, China's economic dominance uh, will remain. That, that is not a transient um, uh, phase in world economic order. India has to work hard to make sure that um, it, it progresses further. But India has changed and, and the progress India has made since it got independence has been quite remarkable. And, and this is worth mentioning that the British didn't expect India to survive as a nation. Churchill had famously said, call India a nation, you might as well call the equator a nation. They expected Pakistan to survive as a virile Muslim country. They said that. British, British leaders, uh, right, right down from Ernest Bevin and others said that Pakistan would survive and they wanted Pakistan to be a strong Muslim country as a buffer against what they saw, the march of Soviet communism. On that note, um, unless there is anything else to add, um, I'd like to thank you very much, Mihir, which was a, a very interesting talk. And uh, thank you for taking the questions from our colleagues. And thank you for putting those questions uh, from fellow club members. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I would uh, like to extend the invitation to you when you're able. Uh, please join us at the club. I'll very happily show you around with Isha <laughs> and Bert uh, and others. Uh, around our uh, fabulous club and uh, what it has to offer and uh, perhaps you even have a bite to eat with us. I, I would look forward to that very much. I have been uh, once or twice to a club. But I haven't seen the pictures, so I can't comment on what the pictures are. I'm sure they're wonderful. <laughs> um, and um, and um, I, I, I shall look forward to, to the lunching or dining at the club. Um, you know, of course, maintaining social distancing and of course, perhaps adopting the, 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 the Indian tradition of and washing your hands frequently and, uh, and doing namaste, not, uh, not shaking hands. Yes.